Let's open our Bibles to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 34, Exodus chapter 34, meeting with God. Moses has come to make an arrangement with God. God is meeting with him and says, now Moses, I want to get alone with you and I want to be with you. Now the prophet Amos preached a different message in his book. The prophet Amos preached a soon coming judgment to the people of Israel. He spoke candidly to the people when he said in Amos 4, verse 11 and 12, I've overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. You see, we see there's a very important principle in God's word. And many times we fail to remember. Many times we fail to persevere with this principle. And that is if there is no repentance, there is no mercy. If there is no repentance, there is no mercy. God's mercy has a direct correlation to our willingness to repent. If we desire the mercy of God, then we must repent. Forgiveness is available to all who would repent. No repentance brings no forgiveness. You see, that's a sad truth for those countries, for those people, for those churches, for those Christians who refuse to repent. Folks, there are sins in our lives perhaps we are unaware of. That's why we need to pray, O oh Lord, allow your Holy Spirit to seek my heart, to examine me and bring forth before me what I need to repent of. That ought to be our daily prayer. But many times we try to hide our sin. We try to embellish, dress up, costumize our sin. When in reality, God sees it. And God would ask one thing of us, that we would repent. In Exodus chapter 34, the first few verses, we're going to see Moses meeting with God. There is an arrangement of the Lord in verses 1 through 4. And in verses 5 through 9, there is the arrival of the Lord. We must prepare before the arrival of the Lord. I hope you prepared for this day. God's presence is here. He said, where two or more are gathered in his name, there am I also in the midst. I'm glad he did not say, where there are thousands gathered together, there am I also in the midst. And I'm glad that God did not give us a limitation on his presence. Moses is going to meet with God. We're going to see his meeting as the arrangement and also his arrival. Look at verse 1 through 3. We see a divine command. And the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these Write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. And then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. We see a direct commandment. The Lord's requisite of charge here in verse 1 and 2. In verse 1 he said there's a time 
to prepare Moses. If you're going to meet with God, there is a requirement, and that requirement is to prepare. God says, I want you to cut two stones. I want you to be ready. He says in verse 2, just simply, be ready. Time to prepare. Our God is a God of second chances, is he not? Our God is not a God who says, okay, one strike and you're out. He is a God of second chances. And for some of us, there have been those of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, sometimes more than that. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says, Though the Lord, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. When I came here 21 years ago, I stepped into this pulpit and I placed where most people do not see. But it is a personal reminder to me. And as I look down here in my pulpit, there I placed, because it is wooden, it's hard to see. You may not even have seen it if you ever came back here. But it says very simply, God is faithful. And that is an ever-present reminder to me when I step into this pulpit that I have a God who is a God of grace, a God of mercy, if I'm willing to repent. And that his faithfulness is given to me as your pastor, as a preacher, that he would have the word for you today. I do not walk into this pulpit thinking I'm not prepared. No one's going to receive anything of this one. There are times I have doubted my, my ability. There are times I have doubted my understanding, but I have never doubted the presence of God in our midst. I have never doubted his faithfulness. Our God is a God of faithfulness, and he has told us to prepare. I hope your heart was prepared before you came here today. That's why I'm glad Sunday School. Sunday School sometimes gives us an opportunity to prepare. The Word of God is a good way of preparing. Perhaps some of us are busy. We're getting ready. If you're like me, you're getting everybody, you know, getting everything together, getting stuff put up, put down, put on, put off, all that good stuff, you know, and you're rushing out the door trying to get everybody into the car. I understand. But when you come, prepare to meet with God. It's a time to present. Look at verse 2. The Bible says, so be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai. God gives us his word as a gift, and he gives us his will as a treasure. And we are stewards of both of them, both the will of God and the word of God. You are responsible, beloved, for the word of God, not only in your life, not only in your family's life, not only in the life of your neighbors, your family, your relatives, and your friends, but in the life of the world. That's why we have missions. We are stewards of both, and we are accountable for both. In verse 3, we see the Lord's restrictive conditions. The Lord does not want you to come before him unprepared. And there are many times that we can become overcome by the things about us. We can be overtaxed by the issues of life. We become overburdened by the burdens that we bear from others or from our own lives. We see here in verse 3 a prohibition of companionship. He says, I want you to be ready, so be ready. That is a personal requirement. Jesus is coming, folks. We ought to be ready. That is not a, a, a suggestion. That is a requirement. That is a command. Christ is coming. I believe it is soon. And my answer for that is simple. Am I ready? You say, well, wait a minute. Is there any occasion that you would have to say, but wait a minute. Jesus can't come today. I've got to do this or I've got to do that. I've got to go here. I've got to speak to so-and-so. Folks, listen. Jesus is coming just as God was coming to Sinai. Moses, be ready. We ought to be ready. 1 John 2, 28, And now little children abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence 
and not be ashamed before him at his coming. The command also notes the distinction of the man Moses. We see that God puts Moses aside. And he says there's something special about Moses and I want to meet with him. So this command denotes the the distinction of Moses. But it also shares with us the holiness of God. There are some people that God's presence cannot come into their presence, lest in his presence they would die. Moses was prepared because God was deed holy. The question is, are you ready? Well, that scares me. I don't know about you. It scares me. I don't want to ever stand before the Lord and the Lord said, John, you're not ready. You were not ready to come before me. Oh, what a tragedy that would be. We see in verse 3 the preclusion of corruption. Not only was he to come without companions, but he said, don't don't even let a man climb up the, the hill. Don't let him even hang around up there. Joshua would come up and he'd go halfway and he would stay there. But Joshua can't come up this time. Moses, it's you and I, God said. And he said, I don't even want your animals near my mountain. I don't want them feeding around my mountain. I don't want them eating around my mountain. Why is that? Because you see, God's presence turns any place into a holy place. This is a holy place. If indeed God's presence is here, if God says that where two or more are gathered in my name, there I'll be also in the midst. If that is true, if God's word is true, his holy presence is here today, and this is holy ground. How many times do we come into God's holy place? No wonder Jesus walked into the temple and said, this is supposed to be my father's house, a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Oh, how many times have people come into the house of God like they're going into a roller skating place or going into the Colosseum or going into a movie theater. Oh, beloved, this is not a place of entertainment. This is a holy place. God is here. His angels are with us. We see his presence turns away any place in the world into a sacred holy ground. Do not treat God's presence with sacrilege attitude. Don't bring your goats and your sheep with you. This is not the marketplace. This is God's house. He is holy. And in his presence, the land is sacred. Place is holy. Exodus 3 5, and then he said, Do not draw near this place. God is speaking to Moses out of the fiery bush. Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place that you stand is holy ground. Oh, the bush wasn't holy. The mountain wasn't holy. The dirt wasn't holy. God is holy, and when his presence there is holiness. Look at verse 4, there's a dutiful compliance. Moses said, okay, Lord, whatever you want. Look at the prophet's obedience, so he cut. He said, all right, I'll I'll do it. So he cut two stones, just like the last ones that he broke. 1 Samuel 15, 22, so Samuel says, as the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of God. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Oh, beloved, we are to obey the word of God. His presence is holy in your life. There are some times when you're there at the table or at your desk at home, or perhaps sitting on the edge of your bed, you might be holding the word of God in a moment of study or in a moment of, of devotion, and you feel suddenly a cool, crispness of delight into your room and you know his presence is there and oh beloved we ought to take off our shoes because we are on holy ground God comes to speak to you 
God comes to share with you. God comes to be with you. And how many times do we rush out the door? How many times do we just kick on down the road when God was there? And he says, I was here to meet with you and I missed you today. Oh, beloved, we fail so often. We all fail so often, perhaps because we are not holy. We see his reconstruction of the stone. The two stone tablets were reconstructed. Now it's important that they be reconstructed. Why? Because with the reconstruction of the two tablets of stone, the restoration of the statutes were brought back. You see, it was a symbolic thing. The stones weren't God's law. Those pieces of rock weren't to be Worship, they weren't to be set aside, to be worshiped, but rather they were symbolic. Just as that Bible you hold in your lap. Folks, that's the holy word of God. How do you treat that today? Well, there are times we throw it in the back of the car. Might be times we throw it on the coffee table. Might be times we just throw it in some place of obscurity. How many times have we had to go and search for our Bibles? How many times, oh, where did I leave that? Where did I put it? Oh, beloved, that that Bible is not to be placed upon a wall and to be worshipped. That is not to be placed upon a coffee table and forgotten. That is symbolizing God's word. It is holy. And if you want to reestablish the holiness of God in your life, get into the word. We see the prophet's obedience, his restoration of the statutes, an act of restoration. You see, in his righteousness, he broke them. In his anger, he broke them. And now he was to restore them. Oh, beloved, there are times as Christians, we have broke the word of God. And our family has suffered. And our friends have suffered. And our nation has suffered. And it is up to us to repent and to restore. Because without repentance, there is no mercy. We see the prophet's obligation. Moses rose early, the Bible says. And he went, the Bible says. The accord of the servant. It is the Lord's servant's responsibility to obey God. Responsibility demands readiness. Oh, beloved, we are to be responsible. Responsible for your families. Husbands, you are responsible for your families. Wait a minute, preacher. We live in a time when men and women and men, we're just all alike. It's okay. We're just, our, our, we understand that that was back then and men were men and women were women, but now we're just all equal. No, the Bible says, husbands, you are responsible. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the world says, folks. You're going to stand before God one day. Lord, Nancy Pelosi says it was okay. See how that works. Wives, it is your responsibility to love and care Provide for your family too. I love that scripture in Proverbs 31 which talks about the mother whose children rise up and bless her. Whose husband says, I have no loss. I have no need of anything. Oh, beloved, what a woman we would have. What a world we would have if we would but be men and women of God's word. We see the accord of the servant Responsibility demands readiness. And look at his ascent to Sinai. He was going up to meet God. You never go down to meet God. Well, you know, perhaps maybe I can, I can do that. I can go down to meet God. Folks, listen, God's not going down. You're going to have to go up. We see the arrival of the Lord in verse 5 through 7, the merciful marks of divinity. 5 through 7 in verse 5, his timely arrival of God's manifestation. 
God finally arrives, Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Beloved, live like it. Jesus is with us. It is a holy presence of God in your life. The Lord's holy presence. And then there's the Lord's holy pronouncement. When he came down, Moses went up, and God, the Bible says, as God passed by, he spoke out his name. Now, folks, he did not do that for everyone. There are many names of God. They knew him as Hashem. They knew him as Elohim. They knew him as Adonai. They knew him for, by many names, El Shaddai. There are many names that God had, but only Moses knew him by his name. Now let me ask you a question, beloved. Do you know God by name? Are you that personal with God? Or do you have to say, well, God, it's, it's me again. <laughs> I know you can't remember my name. It's been a while since I've seen you. You know, that was the one thing down in Florida our people were very good about. We had a church of 26,000 people. Now I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't know everybody's name. And, and what was very, very good about our people is they'd always come and they would always start with, hello, pastor, my name is so-and-so. And it was always good that they did that. Now, I wasn't the, the head pastor. I was not the elder pastor. But lo and behold, they would always tell you their name so that, that you would not be offended or that you would not be, be looked at as ignorant. And I appreciate that. But you see, the question is, they wanted to be intimate. They wanted to be on a first-name basis. The question is, do you want to know God by his name? Do you desire to have a relationship like that? I remember years later, after I met my, <clears throat> one of my high school teachers when I was working at Indiana Purdue University, and I was going through the campus, and Mr. Perkheiser came out, and he said to me, hey, John, how are you doing? I said, Mr. Perkizer, it's so good to see you. He says, just call me Jim. Boy, that felt weird. You know, that was really odd because that was not the way it was. But I'd gotten to a different level, hadn't I? You see, aren't you tired of calling God by a different name? Don't you desire to know God so intimately? you can call him by his name. And then we see the Lord's holy pronouncement. His presence was there, but he had a holy pronouncement. Moses lived a life that he knew God by name. In verse 6 and 7, we see what the Jewish people call the 13 attributes of God's mercy. Now, in verse 6 and 7, the Jewish teaches, the Jewish uh, uh, rabbis teach that this is the method whereby we must pray to invoke God's blessing or God's mercy. We see in verse 6, the Bible says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. I'm going to go quickly through these 13 principles. First of all, they're all connected to a word in those scriptures. First, we see the Lord. That is the name Hashem. That is the holy name. That is the name that the Jewish people believe is so holy, they cannot pronounce it. They cannot even write it down. And so it is to them, Hashem, this is God, who is merciful before a person sins. God is merciful. Before you were born, God was merciful. Before you sinned, God was merciful and is merciful. And then the name is repeated, the Lord, Hashem. This is the God who is merciful after the person sins. We have a God who is merciful for us before we sin, and we have a God that is merciful for us after we sin. And then there's the word God, the word El. The name denotes power as a ruler and authority as a ruler, but his mercy surpasses 
even that name. But God's mercy is first and foremost in his heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But God demonstrates toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, beloved, God's mercy is even above his name. Fourth is the word merciful, which means compassionate. God is filled with loving sympathy for human frailty. He knows your failures. He knows your weaknesses. He knows where you cannot be strong and asks of us to let us <coughs> or have us depend upon him for our strength. And then there's the word gracious. God saves people from distress even when it overtakes them. Aren't you glad that God is gracious in your life? Aren't you glad that God didn't say, oh, boy, you're going to have to get yourself out of this one. I'm tired of helping you. But you know, we have a God who loves us. We have a God who's merciful and gracious. And he's long-suffering. Number six, he's slow to anger. God gives ample time for mankind to reflect and to repent of their sin. God doesn't go, all right, you did that, boom, here's the lightning. <laughs> as soon as you touch it. I saw a kid the other day on, on YouTube who basically thought he could touch an electrified fence and not get shocked. I mean, the kid walked up to it, and I mean, you think it, it says electrified. It doesn't, that, it, you, you, something wasn't working. But anyway, <laughs> but the fence was. But anyway, he touched it, and Susie touched it, boom, and he flew back like somebody knocked him out. And the question is, duh, what did you learn? <laughs> the obvious thing is, we have a God who could do that. We have a God that when we sin, that he knows all sin. He knows where we're at. He sees us there in the darkness of our hearts. But his mercy is that he doesn't strike us then. He is long-suffering, slow to anger. Verse number seven, he's abounding in goodness. God is kind to those who lack personal merit. Oh, there are certain people who just kind of gravitate to that kind of a lifestyle, aren't they? God loves them. But God so loved the world. Aren't you glad he didn't say God so loved the good people? God so loved the, 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 the beautiful people? Number eight, it's truth. God never reneges on his word. He always rewards those who serve him. Always gives grace to those who ask. Mercy to those who repent. And then number nine, mercy for thousands. Now in the Jewish text, they add two words. Mercy for thousands of generations. You see, God remembers the deeds of the righteous for the benefit of generations of offsprings. Do you ever ask yourself, why are there some families that have generations of pastors in their family? Would it be maybe because God says, I remember your goodness, and so I'm going to call these other members of your family? Isn't that interesting? You ever notice why some families, they have several serial... <laughs> serial offenders? <laughs> you ever notice how some families, I mean, you know, my goodness... Yeah, my brothers, and you think, whoa, what? You see, God does not forget the righteousness of, of the family. Number 10, forgiving iniquity. God forgives sin as long as the sinner genuinely repents. I know I can go to God if I truly repent and he will forgive me. That does not make, you Baptists, I've heard this all my life. You Baptists believe in eternal security. That just means you, you've got a license to sin. 
You can do anything you want to because God has to forgive. You just rub that genie lamp of forgiveness and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You got to repent, beloved. You got to repent. It's not just some, here I am, God. It's your word. You got to forgive me. Now what's next? You know, I don't want to sin like that. I got a new wonder, as Adrian Rogers said, when I got saved. Forgiving iniquity. Number 11, transgression. Willful sin. God always allows malicious, repent, re, uh, rebellious sinners an opportunity to repent. God always allows the worst of all sinners. Any person who sins constantly, sins, can't do anything but sin, loves to sin, loves to do what they do. God, even in that mercy and grace, he allows them gives them an opportunity to repent. And then 12, sin of error. God forgives careless, apathetic sins, sins that we commit uh, that we don't even know we commit. God is willing to forgive. Finally, in verse 13, I want to use the Jewish text when it says, who cleanses. God wipes away. He pardons the sins of those who repent. If there's no repentance, there's no cleansing. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, you've got to see the rest of this. And to cleanse us. That's the word meaning pardons us from all unrighteousness. Now, in verse 7, we see also in the last part, starting with the word visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. You see, our unrepentant sin has ripple effects throughout the generations. You ever heard that term like father, like son? This describes demonic succession through sinful generations of families. Demons seek families. They seek families because they have a like heart. And they want to go from generation to generation down the line seeking those families. When that father dies, that evil, unrepentant sinner dies, they rush to the next one and say, okay, I got the next generation. Let's go. Well, I remember daddy. Daddy used to do this. Daddy didn't take no guff off nobody, you know. I love those people that say, well, I, I just, I'm, not, I'm just that way. I'm just, I, I don't put up and I get angry quick. You ever heard of the term sin of the father? Folks, God does give grace, but to those who repent. Finally, in verse 8 and 9, we see Moses' <clears throat> mediation of distinction. In verse 8, the Bible says, So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. We see his earnestness of piety. He didn't say, well, Moses didn't get the concept. <laughs> he just kind of weighed around. God said, you know, you ought to bow down, Moses. <laughs> Why wait for someone to tell you what you need to do? Now, you folks are not stupid. We're not stupid people. We know when we need to be repentive. We know when we need to give God his due. We know we need to be earnest in our piety. And Moses knelt down. He bowed down. And next we see Moses' expression of praise in verse 8 when the Bible says, and he worshiped. Well, wait a minute. I thought you could only do that at church. Oh, you, you've missed out. Beloved, if you think this is the only place that God comes, you've missed out. He went to work with you last week. You just didn't know it. He was waiting for you last week at work, and you didn't know it. He was there at the mall waiting for you where you normally go, and, and you missed him because you didn't know it. The Bible says Moses was reverent as God's prophet. Look at verse 9, the request of God's presence. And then he said, I, if now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. We see the merit of Moses. Moses, if I, God, God if, if, if you will accept me, you know, you get rid of all those crazy people. How about me, Lord? Let me and my family go with you. I mean, there are times that, that people throw you under the bus, beloved. They don't care anything about you. 
Aren't you glad we have a God and we have a person perhaps in this world who does care for you? I'm glad that Deborah's dad cared enough to go visit my dad in the hospital. He led my dad to the Lord. My mom and him were separated. They got back together. My mom got saved. I got saved. My brother got saved. I met my wife in that church. My children were dedicated in that church. We see the merit of Moses. Oh, I, I thank God for men like Moses in the lives of families and friends. And then we see the mercy of God in verse 9. Oh, Lord, if you would, pardon our iniquity, our sin, and take us as your inheritance. Again, he intercedes for Israel and asks for his presence. Let me ask you a question. Do you intercede for your family? Do you intercede for your friends? Do you intercede for people? There are times the Lord has said to me, pray for that person. I might be walking by them or, or see them afar off and the Lord say, pray for that person. I don't know what to pray. And rather than saying, oh Lord, well, duh, I'm pretty stupid. God, I don't know what to pray. I just begin to pray. Do you intercede for people? Do you intercede for your children? Do you intercede for your wife, for your husband? Psalm 119, 156. Great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your judgments. Psalm 103, 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Aren't you glad we have a God like that? Judgment or mercy, preacher? What's God got for me this week? Judgment or mercy? Well, the answer is simple. Repentance or mercy. Repentance or mercy. Oh, beloved, you see, we're stiff-necked people sometimes. Not just the Jewish people. But we can be stiff-necked people sometimes, too. Well, God, I, you know, what do you want me to repent of? Well, if you ask in earnest, God will tell you. But you see, we need to understand that mercy only comes by repentance, only. Meeting with God, oh yes, one day we will. And you know what? Wouldn't you love to meet with God when we get there to heaven, we meet with Jesus, Jesus says, you know, you've taken care of everything before you got here. All I'm going to do is bless you today. All I'm going to do is give you the gifts that I've got for you. I'm going to give you your reward. You're going to walk out of here. It's going to be quick because you've already taken care of all of it before you got here. Oh, wouldn't that be sweet to hear from God? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Let's be